All right, welcome to today's episode. Today we're talking about how to find the right software, how to source the right software, how to decide on finding the right software for your business to help it scale. That all sounds fun. Sounds fun. Software is pretty important, right? Yeah, yeah. But I think we got a couple house cleaning items to chat through first. Number one, clean the glasses. Clean the glasses. Like every episode. Number two, we have a, a new co-host on the show. So if you've seen the last episode, you've you've uh, been introduced to Monica. But if you haven't, this is Monica joining the show. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Hi, Monica. Thank, thanks for being here. <laughs> and next item is we have a new location. Ooh. Where are we at? We are at the beautiful Amity Coworking in the lovely downtown Northville, Michigan. It's pretty neat. We got like this nice mezzanine. We're here like really early in the morning. So nobody else is here, or they are here, and they hear us, and they're like, eh, weird guys podcasting upstairs, <laughs> probably. Some podcast bros, we just leave them alone. That's what yep. I would do. Yeah. They love us. We love them. Yeah, so we're good to go. Everybody, this is our episode, our first episode recording after Halloween, so everybody full of candy. Spooky. Spooky. Yeah, we have way too much candy. Yeah. Um, our kids are young enough so that they want to go trick or treating, but they don't like candy. Mm. So we have to eat all the candy. Our kids are weird. Um, like my my oldest doesn't like chocolate. Mm. Um, okay. We've thought about kicking her out of the family a couple of times, <laughs> but I okay. guess that's frowned upon. So yeah, we're stuck. But we'll find another excuse. I uh, was passing out candy this year, and it was at the end of everyone coming through and there was a ton of candy left and I went to a little girl coming and I was like, can I give you the rest of our candy? And she goes, no, thank you. <laughs> and I looked at her dad and he goes, she's done. And I was like, what just kid is vibes. turning down the the, over. all the yeah. rest of the candy? Yeah. He's like, yeah. How did I'm like, great thing. Right. Maybe the younger generation is figuring out the Halloween, like, isn't this cool? Like, we think it's super cool because it was, like, awesome when we did it. But they're like, what you guys did is dumb. Can we just go play video games now? Yeah. I love Halloween still to this day. Like, my dad's like, do you want to pass out candy? I'm like, absolutely. <laughs> like, yes. Like, yeah. Yeah, I think in, in our region, especially with daylight savings time, I mean, kids are, you know, where we're low, geographically located, our kids are running around in pure daylight. Yeah. Which is, I don't know. Not as spooky or cool as it was back when you know when we were young. Yeah, we used to go out a lot, a lot later. So it was like pitch black darkness outside. Yep. When we were with our pillowcases, going to other neighborhoods yep. alone without our parents. Yep. But now we're you know old people complaining about young kids doing things differently. On our on our the circle is complete. On our business podcast. On our business podcast, <laughs> which you can all relate to because yeah. you are all the same as us. Absolutely. <laughs> awesome. So we're here discussing software, how to choose the right software for your business, uh, the process of going through and deciding whether or not you know a specific software tool is going to help you grow, why you need a software tool to help you grow, and so on. So why would someone, why would a business need software? Well, I mean, it makes everything better. It, it, there are things that software does that like either it's harder for humans to do or it makes humans' jobs way easier to do. Mm -hmm. Those are kind of the bigger of the two reasons to use software. It can also, and then going with that, saves time, saves money. Yeah, you make a human's job easier. It's less... That, that human can focus on the other things that are more time-sensitive or kind of complex that maybe software can't really solve mm -hmm. right now. So it's like a cost effectiveness thing. Pay 200 bucks for a software as opposed to paying that person a thousand bucks to get a project or part of the project off the, off the ground mm -hmm. or like keeping track in Asana or something like that. Something right. that would be very hard to do if you didn't have something like that going on. I think we had mentioned this before, but like how did people do projects in the 1920s? Without yeah. like a computer sitting there and, and like, I think a hammer and a chisel. Yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> um, 
Who yeah. with their uh, calculator. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah thank <laughs> you. That's the word. And I was like, yeah. We got an extra dollar. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to be rich. Is that an extra dollar? Is that is that pushed all the way over? Is that extra? Oh, it was halfway. Oh. Yeah. Control Z? Can we go back? Yeah. <laughs> I don't think well, the Z. that. It was Control Z at the time, probably 1920s. Yeah, yeah. You're Command right. Z. Abacus, Command Z, Control Z. Yeah. Awesome. I don't think that works. So, yeah. I mean, does, you know, deciding on, you know, you, your business might have a unique way of executing projects, you know, executing on work for your clients, right? Um, you might be, you know, you might have the run of the mill. You might have a, a very common business, right? And, and there's a lot of systems and tools and software out there already to choose from that can help your, help your business scale. So yeah, it's, it's important to realize that software is your best friend. It's there to help you. Um, it is not there to hinder your business. If it is hindering your business, it's time to go down the path of you know, understanding there's a problem and let's fix it. And that's, that's a key component of understanding things first. Yep. So you don't get into the trap of finding or buying software that isn't helping yep. your, your, your business. So very thorough discovery is really important for figuring those things out. I've yep. been in a lot of situations with other companies I've worked for where like, you know, they go with one company or they go with one software product and it doesn't fit all of their use cases, but it does like what they needed to do right then. And then a year down the line, they're going to change some process to better, you know, achieve their goals or, or whatever. And this software that they bought and spent a bunch of money on just doesn't do it and they're stuck. So like, do we spend that same amount of money with, on a new product or do we just make do and try and do it weirdly and it, it just either way it just never goes yeah well. i was also with the business that did something very similar they bought a software that didn't really fit all of their needs and we would have to every day spend hours upon hours correcting the system to make it better fit the business yeah. instead of just switching the software and now you're paying people to do what the software was supposed to do in exactly. the first place. And it's just, the whole point is defeated. My job at the end became just refixing what was getting inputted, mm. which the software was supposed to do. Yeah. And yeah. it became several employees' jobs to do that. So at what point? Right. That's the worst. So there, there's there's two types of softwares that we, we talk about here. There's the you know, quote unquote, off the shelf software, which is software that's already built mm -hmm. that you pay just like a monthly fee or annual fee or membership fee, call it whatever for use. And then there's the custom software route uh, where you, um, you know, work with a software development company or you hire software developers to come into your company and build the actual software that your company needs. So we're, when we're talking about software, we're really talking about two different, mm -hmm. um, you know, avenues that businesses go when selecting or choosing or dealing with software. Um, so yeah, a lot of what we're, we've just been discussing is more of the off the shelf where a company is just like reached, you know, Google searched potentially, you know, give me the best project management software. Yeah. Asana or uh, Asana. Was it? <laughs> yeah. Don't mention the there, other ones. There's Asana, there's you know, there's Rike, there's ClickUp, there's you know, there's probably ten that are, you know, very, 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 very good. Right? That can do like we just talked about, seventy to eighty yeah. percent. It can get you there. But the more unique your business is, right, and the more you know, the more intricate your business is and the more detail oriented you are to execute on projects the further away off the shelf becomes valuable to your business. Right. Right. The more custom software becomes valuable. So it's really important to, you know, to really understand how unique, like during that discovery process you mentioned, really understanding, okay, how unique are we? Right. Like how, how important is it that we don't find ourselves in a situation where we're undoing stuff that gets tossed into this project management tool? Yeah. Right. And what are we going to be doing in a year, two years, five years yep. when we still want to be getting value out of the software tool, but right. are we going to be doing something different? Can we do things differently? Yep. Understanding the long-term strategy is, of course, very beneficial. Yep. That's definitely something during the discovery process we certainly talk about. Yeah. 
So where do you want to go from here? I don't know. McDonald's? <laughs> <laughs> do you think they have custom software? They 100% uh, have custom software. Yeah. Their, uh, their app and their uh, one of the kiosks that they have. Yeah. yeah. Mo- most companies will, will most Fortune 500 companies will opt for building custom software. Yeah. They will not, you know, some, you know, of course, Fortune 500 companies have thousands of software that they use to do thousands of different things. Some softwares kind of handle, like a CRM would handle a handful of different processes mm-hmm. and things. But, you know, a very large company like McDonald's will have off the shelf software doing X amount of things and they'll custom build things, right? Their public website's custom built, their app is custom built, right? But their maybe their project management software they use to execute on that might be like a you know Jira yeah. Atlassian, right? At, at some point, why reinvent the wheel when something right. like project management is a very standard process for the most part? So mm-hmm. the software built to handle it is probably very following that standard right. at the same time. So there's not much like there is some customability and maybe like integrating certain processes with your business into it might be might be a mm-hmm. thing, but that can be easily handled by, by a human. That's just fine. Yep. But like when it comes to using the McDonald's as an example, I don't think there's an off-the-shelf thing. Like you're not going to go and find a mobile app builder to build your kiosk. No. That's going to handle like all of your sales in your stores or like right. 90% of the sales yeah. in your stores. Variables. So yeah. You're, you're going to want a custom solution for something like that. Right. So asking kind of like a silly question, but if I was a new business, it sounds like custom software is just a no brainer. You would want something that's going to best tailor your business to help it grow and be more productive. So why would someone choose something that's already built out entirely? Cost is probably the biggest factor, or maybe like with the project management example of, Something already exists out there that's doing something like your business is very simple. Like if you're a normal retailer Mm -hmm. just selling clothes in a shop or something, there are tons of POS systems out there Mm -hmm. that have already been built that are off the shelf that could handle the very simple stuff that you need need to do for it. Um, Or like a restaurant. Yeah, a restaurant. There's tons of spot on, right? Yeah. So why would you do that necessarily? Like get a custom thing built when it's a use case that's very well known and standard and there's lots of stuff for it. That's why you probably wouldn't go custom. Now, should you still have experts or hire a company to help you implement those things? Probably, um, especially if you're really serious about it and it's complex type of stuff, then that would be a good idea. Um, so you don't necessarily need, or you're, you're just because you're not doing a custom solution doesn't mean that you might not need a software company to to help you implement some of those we call no, the no code tools or no code tools. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, you brought up you brought up cost. Budget certainly is a is a you know probably the next next topic of of discovery. You know, understanding your really good understanding of your business, how unique it is, the long term strategy, and then also understanding you know obviously what your budget is, right? And between the two different softwares options, right? They are different, but from a long term strategy, right? If you're factoring that in, right? Like off the shelf software, some is free yeah yeah. right so there's no way to even compete with that right but as you want to add on bells and whistles or you want to bring in other users your company grows you're adding employees right costs begin to rise on the off the shelf right you're you know you're charged per seat right so you're charged you're charged by a handful of different things depending on the type of off the shelf software you're going with you're charged by the seat you're likely charged you know an annual cost to use the system um and then you're also, you know, on the hook for any price increases that that off-the-shelf software comes with. Right. As over the years, as they decide to just increase their price. So, you know, if you're looking at a hundred bucks a month right now for off-the-shelf software for you and you know two or three other you know, employees on your team, all of a sudden you scale to ten employees right within a year, and you've gone from a hundred dollars a month to a thousand dollars a month. And then all, yeah. and then all of a sudden, the, you know, the software you're using is implementing 25% increase in, you know, their membership, right, or their, you know, way to use the product. All of a sudden, you're now, you know, 
Yeah, and that can be really tough when you're trying to grow because you're you're putting all number one, you're putting all of that time and effort and money into getting new people. Mm-hmm. You have to pay them that that stuff before you start kind of capitalizing on what they're bringing to the business and like making more money. So right. all of these overhead things, including people power and the increased cost of those people to actually do your work, mm-hmm. makes it really hard to jump those hurdles and, and go to the next level of right like business profit. Right. Now the other the other option, right, the custom build, right? There's certainly you know, certainly other things that are that are paid for. Obviously you gotta pay to have it built. Right. right. But what you pay, right, could be flexible. What you pay could be, you know, over a long period of time, right, or a short period yeah. of time, depending on, you know, what the software is, what the company is. And you could be strategic too in like obviously when you buy a off the shelf software, it's gonna come with all the things that were built into it. Some things you might not need yeah. or want. When you're doing the custom route, you get to decide what's gonna be in, in your software and what you're gonna need at that time. So if you're smart about it and you're really into the discovery process and really like in tune with your developers, you you come up with like exactly what you want the software to do now. And then if you want to add stuff later, you can add stuff later. Mm-hmm. Things, things can happen over time instead of having to put all that cost either up front or in a subscription based model or, yep. or something like that. Yep. So definite pros and cons to the to the budget. Yeah. <laughs> question there. Yeah, and certainly the you know the custom built route, right? The the cost that goes into building that is certainly you know an investment into the business, right? Right. As you know, as as the same as the off the shelf, like the sub- subscription you're paying every single month, right? Somewhat different than the investment you put into build custom software plus that's you know intellectual property for your business, right? Right. That makes it even more unique and enticing for you know, a sale of the business, you know, 10, 15 years down the road or whatever the long-term strategy is, right? That makes sense. Yep. And then, you know, once once you've paid for the software to be built, right, you're basically done paying. Yeah. All you're really paying at that point is maybe hosting fees, which... Or maintenance or something Maintenance, like that, right. Which is negligible compared to the cost of building the software in the first place. Right. I'd imagine. Right. Are you going to say something else? She's staring off into the distance. Oh, okay. Is there something over there? I think there's a butterfly or something. <laughs> awesome. So, yeah. So, you know, just really understanding the two different, you know, pieces of, you know, software options that are available to companies. Um, and when it comes to a lot of what we run into as software developers, uh, building software for companies, unique software applications for companies is... Google Sheets, right? The no-code tool, right? That's accessible to really everyone that is wonderful and great. Sometimes companies over, you know, overuse or get overwhelmed with, you know, thousands and thousands of Google Sheets that they stitch together, right? So then they come to us with a pile of Google Sheets and we work to try to transfer that over into, you know, a very simple, scalable, you know, software solution. So, um, while we brought up Asana and ClickUp and, you know, the other ones, Google Sheets is certainly a big one that, you know, a lot of companies use to... Yeah. And it kind of makes sense. At the beginning of your business, you want to use the least expensive thing and you have Google Sheets, which is 100% free. Yeah. Um, you don't have to pay anything for, for that. You can share it with anybody that you want. And it just makes sense that you use that and then you get to a point where you're using it so much and you've grown and you're like, well, now I'm kind of stuck. Yeah, using these Google Sheets and it's very hard to manage. I was about to say a lot of information can get lost that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So great tool. The sooner you can afford going away from Google Sheets, probably the better. Yeah, yeah. You will find your you will find yourself creating new Google Sheets, assuming you don't have the data. When you do have the data, you've got other team members creating sheets over here. Yeah, it just becomes a it becomes a you know an overhead management nightmare in a way. Right, but it does. It does. It is powerful. It yep. does it does do a lot? Um. So my question is: In what ways have you seen software solutions fail to meet a business expectation? Google Sheets, <laughs> 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 while wildly wildly successful, right? We've as of recent, you know, we've found you know companies that have just piled on the Google Sheets and piled them on and piled them on, just become overwhelmed. 
right? And, it, you know, I believe that while the companies are using Google Sheets in a pretty fascinating way, right, I think we found the limit, right, to, mm-hmm. to utilizing Google Sheets when it becomes too much to manage and you need more automation. Um, so that's... The more hands that touch Google Sheets, the more complex things get. Yeah. The more lost in the weeds... Yeah, your files and your data and, and who owns what and what's the source of truth becomes. Mm-hmm. And then there was there was another one where um, kind of real life example for us. We were we were put on a very large project uh, to augment a, another team, and they used an off the shelf uh, project management uh, tool, and it was so over engineered mm-hmm. and set up that it was extremely difficult to go in and find the actual tasks that needed to be completed. Mm-hmm. And there were processes that were built in place that were never communicated. Like oh, there wow. were processes upon processes, when to do this, when not to do this, when to update this, when you do update this, what you need to have along with it, never communicated out. So when you like over-engineer the setup of your off-the-shelf system, it can become a burden to then pass those processes down to vendors or to new employees, right? Your, your new employees might have a longer mm. curve of being brought up to speed on how to use the tool if processes aren't kind of dialed in, minimal, right? Dialed, you need processes, but when you over-process it, it's, it becomes a problem. This doesn't sound like a project I was on, thankfully. No. no. <laughs> this, this might have been uh, before my time. Yeah. We shielded you from yeah. <laughs> from that. Just <laughs> just knowing protect this, the Jason. <laughs> this one, this one, I fit Jason's personality very well. <laughs> yeah. So, do you think custom software can give you a competitive edge um, with competitors? Oh yeah, yeah. Because I mean, with custom software, you can tailor fit something to do what your your business does like the way that your business does it so like going back to the mcdonald's example they were kind of the first ones to get that the whole kiosk thing right okay that's a that was a huge competitive thing for them because they did it like basically right before the pandemic hit right before we got worried about like interacting with human beings and Mm -hmm. and stuff Mm -hmm. like that so they were like bam we're ready to go Mm-hmm. They had the advantage when, when COVID hit, when they had to shut down dining rooms and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. As things started opening up, like those kiosks were, all, were already there. You could already go into the store, type the thing in, maybe wash your hands afterwards, but you wouldn't have to interact with a human or talk with someone face to face to get your order. And then someone just put it on the counter and you walked away. Mm-hmm. So like that was a huge competitive advantage for them to have a custom software yep. in place. So yeah. Yep. We didn't plan. We didn't like plan that question and answer. That was no completely from my head. I'm trying to think of. I'm trying to think of if there was another one to bring out. I'm just it's escaping me. I mean, I like I like how you mentioned like you know tailor fit, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know when you develop, when you have a you know a unique business you know proposition on you know executing projects for your client, right? Your customers and you know turnaround time is of the essence. Yeah. Right? If you don't have, if you haven't over-processed things and you don't have extra fluff in your software tool to get in the way of, like, getting work done, you've built this, like, tailored, just bespoke, like, from A to Z, bam, do this, bam, and we're done, and your turnaround time is fast, your client's going to love you. Right? Yeah. Or think of, think of like, um, the web app and web design experience, like, Squarespace, very easy to get a website up and going right now. But you can kind of tell when a website is a Squarespace website, Mm -hmm. just by the way that it looks and the integrations and stuff like that. Um, So if you have a custom design and a custom solution for that, like obviously you're going to stand out from the competition because your website's going to look like your brand, Mm -hmm. not someone else's brand fit to your colors or something like that. Plus, on the web app side of things, you can integrate a whole lot more when you have a custom solution than when you have something like Squarespace. Squarespace, yeah, you can get like a gallery and sell items or something like that, but could you integrate a third-party system that handles your listings for your short-term rental market? Mm. 
I don't know, maybe they can, but I've never right. seen a Squarespace site do something like, like right. that necessarily, like a really complex thing yeah. that integrates a custom API into a custom website. Right. Square, Squarespace is going to come after us now. Be like, actually, we can do this, and we're going to show you how. And that's great. No that's, that's called competing or competing businesses yeah. benefiting the consumer. Yeah. We are not at Amity Coworking. We are not in downtown Louisville. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Squarespace don't come after us and make a Super Bowl ad about us. That'd be terrible. Never. <laughs> Squarespace making websites, making websites. Making websites. Thanks, Adam Driver. <laughs> Love you, buddy. Best friends. Awesome. What other what other FAQs do we have lined up? Monica has good questions. <laughs> yeah. What is a common misconception CEOs or CTOs have when deciding on software for their company? We can make do with Google Sheets for a little bit longer. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you love Google Sheets, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> love love hate relationship. Probably the the misconception is one of them is the cost. Yeah. Right. The misconception is you know we'll have to shelf software so you know so cheap so I mean we might as well go with that because we don't you know. It's not in our budget to build, you know, custom software with the assumption that it's too expensive. Right. Right. We need to, we need to really understand what it is, you know, your business does and how custom software could be effective for your business. The end cost might not even be anywhere near what you're thinking or what you've heard. It might be way less. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So the misconception is custom software is likely too expensive or, you know, it's, you know, too much to handle, or once you get it up, then you got to, you know, pay a team to maintain it or manage it, right? And all of that is, you know, that's misconception. That's, you know, there's myths coming into play there, so. That's a good answer. Yeah, but yeah, oh yeah, we can we can handle this with Google Sheets. Yeah, that's, or we'll, we'll the, use The this, CEO yeah. says, who has no, only views those sheets and doesn't actively work in them every, yeah. every single day, where the lay person at the bottom is yeah. dying in their house, trying to figure out where all this data is coming right. from, and where it's or supposed they, to be. Yeah, or they get sent one of the 30,000 that, yeah. that are all getting worked <laughs> on at the same, right? Or maybe the CEO is, you know, they've got their, you know, their sleeves rolled up and they're working on the 30,000 and, you know, maybe they're living in it. Yeah. And they're thinking right now, like, oh, yeah, man. I wish I didn't go this route. <laughs> man. man. I wish I had listened to Matt on his podcast. Yeah. Matt and Jason and Monica are totally speaking to me right now. <laughs> Where were you 10 years ago? Yeah. In discussing, you know, the custom software route, right, let's, let's discuss a little bit what that does look like. Mm-hmm. Right. We've talked about before on this podcast, there's the five phases to building software, whether it's just a, you know, a website, web app, right? Or if it's custom software, that's your, your company completely uses securely, privately, right? Um, there's always, there's always the discovery phase that happens first. And really that's just fact finding. That's what it is. This, mm-hmm. this software needs to do. What are the business goals? What does it need to look like? Who's the audience? Is this going to be sold? Is this going to, you know, is there a subscription model? Is it, is it hit, you know, is it secure behind a firewall, right? Like a, we need to uncover all of that information. Um, and then once, once we kind of get through discovery is when all of us and all the stakeholders really have a solid understanding of like what this thing is, right? Then we can successfully move on to a design phase where we're, you know, UI, UX, where we're legitimately designing what all the screens are going to look like. If this is a website, we're designing all the pages, right? Potentially the components. Um, but we're really, you know, honing in on what the design of this thing is going to look like. If it's in the public, obviously it needs to be, you know, beautiful and efficient and performant, right? It needs yeah. to be fast. It needs to be on brand. Um, if it's, you know, locked behind a firewall, you know, Active Directory accesses it. It, you know, design doesn't necessarily have to be like as, you know, overly engineered. It's more about function, right? right. Now the team's using it. This, this thing needs to function, you know, way better than probably what it looks. But we design it so that we, you know, all of us collectively and the stakeholders of the business have a really solid understanding of what this thing's going to look like, how it's going to function, right? We hone in on that. We agree on that. We move forward into development. This is where we actually build what we've designed against the business goals defined in discovery. So, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Going back to the beginning of what you were saying is how how does a company decide what they need? 
better benefit their business? Mm-hmm. Like, how can they sit down and go, okay, this is I need the software to do this 100%, and then how do they not make a list a mile long? Mm-hmm. And how do they hone in on what's actually important, actually yep. the software needs to do to better perform their business? Very good question. So all the stakeholder, all the stakeholders need to have input, right? Whether it's the C-suites or whether or not it's directors, management level. Um, obviously, some input from from the workers, some yeah. input from you know the, the folks on ground level. I'm actually. a big proponent of that. Like, yeah, the more people you can involve from the ground level, the yep. better your software is going to work for them. And ground ground level could also be customers. Yeah, that are using your website or customers that are using your mobile app. Right, getting feedback from them is, is obviously extremely important. I was just about to say how yeah. important would feedback be in that sense. Um, Absolutely. And asking your customers like, hey, this is what's currently mm-hmm. happening. Is this yep. meeting your satisfaction? Mm-hmm. How can we be better? Yep. And we talked about, I think, the, the rice method before. Where Yeah, I forget which episode that was, but there's yeah. an episode about the rice method. Maybe we'll put them in the show we'll, notes. Yeah, it'll, you, we'll link to it right, right here. There. <laughs> or it might end up being here. <laughs> I'm going to purposely Maybe not have here. it like somewhere that's not anywhere we're playing. It's going to be hilarious. <laughs> it's right across uh, Matt's face yeah, the entire yeah. video. <laughs> but the, the rice method is, and there's also the, the Moscow method, uh, must have, could have, wish, you know, could have Moscow. Yeah. Um, but you do actually make a long list. You know, this, this software needs to do all these things and you really need to, you know, really put it all out there. An exhaustive list, right? And then using the rice method, you begin to analyze your list, right? And that rice method produces a formula, you know, over and if you do this in a Google sheet, <laughs> we'll produce a formula for each of these features and the formula will actually begin to indicate which features are actually extremely important for a minimum viable product. What should we release immediately? And then you've got a backlog of features, but yes, you certainly want to make that very long list and how you write that list. Right, could be on a whiteboard, could be post-it notes up on the wall, could be using a tool called Miro, a no-code off-the-shelf tool called Miro, mm-hmm. which we love. And um, sometimes you can get a company to do this steps for you or absolutely. with you, like in a discovery yeah. phase that you pay a company for. Right, um, which is sometimes pretty advantageous because then you get perspectives outside of you yep. and your culture. It, it, it's you know. Which is something that Moonello does helps companies with discovery phases, and we, you know, we we're really good at helping companies really think through, mm-hmm. really get into the weeds about features and why this is needed, and developing KPIs, right? And, you know, developing a strategy to go against those KPIs. So yeah, really good question. Certainly, in a room would be good if you're all virtual and remote. You're just getting on a couple Google Meets or Zooms, right? Or could be. Microsoft Teams or Skype, whatever. Or just one guy in a corner with a notebook yeah. who makes the plan and doesn't get input from anybody yeah. else. We've seen that work out 0% of the time. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's my time, it plans. It yeah. The time. yeah. <laughs> so good question. Um, as soon as we, you know, go through the development, the third stage, right, and then we go into testing, right, where we're, you know, quality assurance, QA is validating what has been developed against the designs and the business goals, the designs, functionality, business goals. And then once it leaves the testing phase, right, moves on to production, right, we're basically in launch phase, which is the last, you know, the last phase where we're a lot of, you know, depending on if it's a small little website is completely different from a full-on mobile app that's launched that's connected to 30 different APIs, right? Um, we're keeping an eye on things, we're you know, updating variables, we're checking things, we're fixing any issues, right? Launch phase is certainly extremely important. Um, and then you've got, you know, maintenance and management or whatever comes, you know, after launch, right? Which can be you know, different or custom or run of the mill, but you typically have, you know, that's that's the process you go, which isn't, you know, there's, there's a science and a sophistication to, um, to the five different phases, right? As simple as we just made it sound, right? Um, different from, you know, let's just go with this tool and start paying. There's a strategy to it. Yeah, who can yeah. who can tell us how to use this tool? Now we got this tool that we're paying, you know, every month for this tool, but who can show us how to use it? But if you're paying for the tool, then you get access to their their uh, knowledge base. If so you, you can do searches on your own. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or you can pay a company, that same right. company, more money right. for help and support. Yeah. I was just about to say, <laughs> yeah. a lot of times you have to pay for that extra help. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, it's almost like that's a recent situation we've been dealing <laughs> yeah. with. Yeah, yeah. Where the account person is like, yeah, well... Yeah, we'll take care of you. Yeah, absolutely. As soon as you're, you know, as soon as you're in in the system, you know, you'll be. As soon as you're a customer, it's like, yeah. oh, we're done. Yeah. Oh, here's the link to help you with implementation, and you click the link, and and it's an out of date knowledge base. Out of date knowledge base. Yeah. But hey, you can pay us, and we'll help you. Yeah. More. Yeah. Pay us more. For my favorite. Send us an email, and we'll get back to you. Yeah. They never get back to you. Boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that is. Um, yeah, that's really the difference between the two. That's, you know, figuring out how to decide, um, thinking about long term, thinking about budget, right? understanding that there's myths and, you know, misconceptions on, you know, both sides, right? both mm-hmm. sides of the coin. Yeah. And it's real interesting as we kind of like wind down. Um, most of the time you think about money first when you make those considerations, but most of what we talked about, we mentioned money like a couple yeah. of times, but most of it, there's so much more than just the financial cost mm-hmm. of, of the two options. There's, yeah, there's a lot that you have to think about outside of cost. Yep. It also sounds like when you're building a cost in software, you definitely want to hire like professionals to do it and involve the professionals early on in the stage. Yeah. Like you're saying, like, you know, little hopes companies yeah. from just developing the company's needs for that software. Yeah. And the more that you have that outside perspective, it's more beneficial because you're doing this yep. day in and day out and you're seeing a million other companies go through the same process. So it's going to be more beneficial for that company to involve you from those early stages. Yep. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. We don't give away like secrets or anything, <laughs> but yeah. obviously we gain a perspective from working with different companies in different industries that we right. bring to the other customers that we, we work right. with. So, Possibly yeah. can get that leg up with the kiosk. Right. Yeah. So, McDonald's will help you. <laughs> so if you're if you're currently vetting uh, Susie in HR's nephew who <laughs> may have put up a Squarespace site to build the custom software for your business. Um, maybe rethink that strategy. Maybe rethink that strategy. <laughs> Go with a professional, you know. Go with a professional, or train Susie's nephew to become yeah, a professional, yeah. right? And then have you know Susie's nephew help you out. Certainly, nothing wrong with that. And then pay him a little bit wage. <laughs> <laughs> and we have a winner. <laughs> minimum, minimum wage. <laughs> Wouldn't be in the Manella Show episode if I didn't complain about capitalism or something like yeah. that. So. <laughs> and with that <laughs> <laughs> oh by the way Twitter sucks <laughs> oh. uh, now you're talking my language <laughs> uh, I, I know we're going on a little tangent before we leave but earlier episodes like the first five episodes there's like there's almost like an unstated segment where I would just like riff on Twitter for a minute or two because like when when Musk took over and he was doing all the weird things, he's still doing weird things, but all the weird things was like breaking Twitter and I would complain about it every every episode. And was, yeah. Um, speaking of that, I listen to many podcasts and because I don't pay for my podcasts, I get ads and one of the ads is a Twitter uh, podcast ad and it's called Flipping the Bird. <laughs> and okay, because it goes both like yeah, both ways. Sure, is because sure. Elon, like he came in and he completely changed everything, but it also he destroyed everything. And yeah. So it just like it it goes into how like he's made it all crash and burn and everything. And I could spend hours talking about what he's trying to make it and how it's not gonna ever work. And, are, are you gonna pay a dollar a month to have Twitter if that comes to us? No. <laughs> No. We'll see. We'll see who will. It's just a dollar. Most businesses will. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but then it's just it, it what comes. consumers are going to be on it then. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it kind of sucks because as we're living through some very serious world events right now, mm-hmm. like the best place you can get on the ground from the people experiencing the heartache news is from sites like like Twitter. Twitter's probably one of the best for that. Oh, is that CNN? No, it's probably not oh. CNN. It's <laughs> definitely not Fox News. Um, it's not for my grandma? No. Maybe stay away from Newsmax. Um, 
I'm making some enemies here, but I think it's okay <laughs> they have the enemies I'm making. Everybody has a right to their opinion. Yep, yep. Unless you're wrong. Um, <laughs> I was going to be so upset when I tell her this later. Well, but anyway, when like, Grandma downloads this podcast episode, she'll hear you say that. Twitter is great for getting that, that, that perspective, and it sucks that Twitter is turning into something that is bad at other things while being good at, at those things you want it to be good at. So you're telling me you're not going to be banking with Twitter? I will probably not go to the Twitter bank. Okay. Well, it's very sad. Sorry. I don't support Musk. <laughs> it's the... Anything, anything else we want to talk about on Twitter? <laughs> you have whole episodes about Twitter. I was just about to say, when's your next episode about Twitter? <laughs>